Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, to everybody who is here. I want to uh, just introduce myself very quickly. My name is Abdi Soltani. I'm the Executive Director of the ACLU of Northern California. And I'm just delighted to be here with all of you. Uh, so can, is the sound okay? Can you all hear me? Okay, great. So I am your host for the opening morning session. And the way we're going to do this is I'm not going to be standing up here talking at you. I'm going to be your host, Geraldo Rivera. <laughs> and so if you're under a certain age, you may not remember what Geraldo did. Uh, but I'm going to be just walking around and we're going to have a conversation about our vision for freedom and equality and liberty in California and in our country and the example that we want to set for the world. So that's what we're going to be doing together. So before we get into that part, let's um, start with getting a sense of who we are and how far we've come. So let me ask, who here is from San Diego or Imperial County? <laughs> So one of the advantages of working together as the ACLU of California is that for those of us who live in Northern California or the ACLU of Southern California's area, which covers LA and Inland Empire and Orange, etc., the border between California and Mexico, it's not just a border between San Diego and Imperial County in Mexico. That's the border between all of California and Mexico. So in addition to all of the work that our San Diego affiliate does to ensure that every person has rights in that county, the unique, unique difference that the San Diego affiliate can bring to all of us is that we need to be paying attention to that border. That's our border with Mexico. In addition, the San Diego affiliate is leading some groundbreaking work in the areas of immigrants' rights and from the San Diego affiliate is emerging new work to ensure that every person who is eligible to vote has the opportunity to register and to have that vote counted and to ensure that that fundamental right is protected and you'll be seeing more work on voting rights coming out of the ACLU uh, led by our team in San Diego. Now I'm going to break up Southern California a little bit because it's so big. So let me hear it if you are from Orange County. We have Orange County in the house today, and, and okay, wow. They're coming, they're coming, they're on their way. They're, they're, they're still catching some waves, they're still catching some waves. So how about um, San Bernardino or Riverside counties? Yeah. Now, now let's, um, let's, let's have you all stand up. San Bernardino and Riverside counties, let's stand up and let's give them a round of applause. So why is that important? Those two counties are two of the largest, fastest growing counties in our state. That's the future of California in terms of growing political power, but that's also where there's some of the greatest disenfranchisement. It also is home to the two of the largest counties with the highest both rates of incarceration, but also highest numbers of people incarcerated. San Bernardino is now actually going to charge people. Am I, am I about to say a correct sentence, Kelly? About to? Okay, I'll keep going. They're going to charge people to stay in county jail as if they're staying at the Holiday Inn. Did I get it right, Kelly? Close enough. Oh yeah, you should just know, I am not a lawyer, okay? I am not, a, I'm not telling you what your rights are or what the law is or anything like that. My job is to just get us all involved and then I, they'll set me right when I'm way off base on the rights part. <laughs> Who's here from uh, on any other part of Southern California such as Los Angeles County or Ventura or Santa Barbara? Let's, let's uh, see a show of hands. Let's raise your hands if you're from that region. So all 
of Southern California is important, but let's just know, Los Angeles County is the seat of power in this state. Mm -hmm. All right, let's not ever be confused about that. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles County is over one quarter of the state's population. We have 58 counties, but one county alone is over a quarter of the state's population. Los Angeles County's men's jail is the largest jail facility. The jail system of LA, the largest local incarceration facility, isn't it, in the world? Am I overstating? Or at least in the country? And we are the world's leading jailer, so maybe there's a jail in China and someone's going to catch me on this video and say, look, the ACLU guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but the point is that everything that happens in L.A. County is of a magnitude and a scale that affects not only every life in L.A., it affects the entire state of California and it affects the entire country, too. Moving north, I'm going to come up on the beautiful coastal route. So if you're along the central coast of California, Santa Barbara and Ventura or Monterey, raise your hands if you're in that beautiful coast. Okay. And so there we have some of the you know, very long-standing leaders of the ACLU, and I'm looking at the group here from Monterey who've been working on these issues of civil rights and equality um, for generations. And each generation has succeeded in looking and recruiting the next generation. And that generation now is getting the next group involved. And it's just an <coughs> honor to work with all of you here who have been involved in the ACLU for lifetimes. Um, and I'm not just singling out Monterey. There's people here from, uh, who've made this cause of civil liberties and equality their life's work, whether uh, as teachers or school teachers, as lawyers in their communities, um, as farm workers, it takes a lifetime to achieve the changes that we're working on. So then we come to the San Francisco Bay Area. So if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, raise your hands. So obviously there's a lot of ACLU members in the Bay Area and you know you think of the Bay Area as this place where everything is going to be great. And there is a lot that's great about the Bay Area. The San Francisco Pride Festival. Wow, what an event. We invite you all to join us in June at Pride Festivals throughout the state. But of course, if you want, come to the one in San Francisco because it will blow your mind. <laughs> um, but at the same time, there are great civil liberties problems in San Francisco, in Oakland, in San Jose. Um, what happened to Oscar Grant on the BART system that I ride every day, that should not happen in Oakland. It should not happen in California. It should not happen anywhere in the world. And that's the San Francisco Bay Area. And what about the Central Valley? If you're from Bakersfield, <laughs> Let's, let's, let's have you all stand, if from Bakersfield through to Sacramento, up through Chico, the bread basket, well, the fruit basket of America. Okay, now everybody who knows me knows that I'm obsessed with the Central Valley. I tried to persuade my wife years ago that we should move there. Uh, she can't stand temperatures about above 70 degrees, <laughs> let alone 110 degrees. So let's just say that, um, although I can't move there, uh, we're delighted that just this year the ACLU has opened an office in Fresno uh, to be the anchor for our work. And the Central Valley is important for many reasons. Like the Inland Empire, it's a part of the state that's growing. It's a part of the state with a great deal of poverty, but it's also, like every other place in California, a place where inspiring people are standing up to defend their rights every day and to defend the rights of their community as well. Now let's not forget the far northern part of California. 
<laughs> so if you're here from Humboldt County or any of the further counties of the northern <laughs> state. <laughs> So the northern part of the state is sparsely populated, it's isolated, and actually reminds me a little bit of the work that the ACLU of Montana has to do. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, it's tough work. There are a lot of people, the people are facing a lot of basic civil liberties violations. A lot of things that you hear about in, you know, we don't have that much of the, like the teaching of the Bible in the classroom stuff in the Bay Area, but in the northern, northern part of the state, you're facing challenges that we want you to know that all of us, um, from our border with Mexico to our border with Oregon, we are united here as the ACLU of California. So it's delightful to be part of such great company. Uh, Kevin Keenan, who is the ACLU of San Diego's executive director, uh, he always talks about, let's remember how powerful we are. The ACLU of California has, together, our membership throughout this state, it's over 100,000 people. And look, the ACLU, it's not a group that, like, everyone's comfortable joining. Let's face it, all right? It's controversial. We defend the rights of illegal immigrants. <laughs> We defend, <laughs> we defend with pride the right of homosexuals. <laughs> we defend with pride the rights of people who are accused of crime, including sex offenders. <laughs> what else can I say? I mean, we defend the right to free speech. <laughs> even at Nazis. So look, even despite all that, or because of that, <laughs> we have over 100,000 people who are members of the ACLU. Now, I obviously was using a tone I don't normally use when I describe the people whose rights we defend, but I think you know what I meant. We have over 100 staff who work full-time analyzing the law, preparing lawsuits, organizing communities, writing press releases, doing the accounting, paying the bills for this conference, raising the money for all the work that we do. Uh, so that's a great deal of resource and capacity that we have. We get a lot of interesting news articles every year that have the ACLU written in it. This year there was one that caught our eye. This is an article in the Sacramento Bee, and it ranked the American Civil Liberties Union in the top five most effective lobbying organizations right here in Sacramento influencing the state legislature. And we, on the rest of the list, were groups with dozens of lobbyists, not four. Groups who can write checks to politicians instead of just writing excellent letters explaining the law. But part of what makes them so effective in Sacramento is that they have each and every one of you, when they're speaking in the Capitol, they're speaking with the force of our entire membership and all of our supporters with them. And they're speaking with the Constitution and America's most cherished ideals as their most powerful tool. So that is the ACLU of California. Um, Hector said this is the first time, to anyone's knowledge, that we've gathered together like this as one statewide voice. Now, we are still three separate ACLU affiliates. There's the ACLU of San Diego, the ACLU of Southern California, and the ACLU of Northern California. We're not merging into one technically. We're just merging in terms of the day-to-day -day work we're going to carry out together and the impact we're going to have for this state. So with that, let's get a sense of what the work itself looks like. 
So now I'm going to turn into Geraldo. So we talked a little bit about power and that the ACLU has power. And when I say the ACLU has power, I'm saying that each and every one of you has power. And the power that we have, we want to use it to advance people's rights. Rights that are fundamental to this country. So I'm going to just start over here with Kelly. And we had dinner last night, uh, a, group, a small group, there were some meet-up dinners for us all to get acquainted. And uh, we had a chance to hear a bit about Kelly's story. So Kelly is going to do a lot more talking. <laughs> and a lot more speaking of telling this story. Uh, but Kelly, my understanding is you spent some time in one of California's state prisons that every person in this room paid for with your hard-earned tax dollars. Yes. So tell us what happened and why you were there. My name is Kelly Turner. In 1988, I committed a robbery. In 1992, I committed a robbery. And in 1997, I was sentenced to 25 years to life under California Three Strikes Law for the crime of forgery. In 2009, the courts released me. They resentenced me to seven years and recalled my life sentence. And today, I want my life to be an instrument for everyone that's in this room to help change some of the ill practices in the justice system. <laughs> the third time that you said you had forged a check. How much did you forge a check for? $146.16 at a department store. And even after your sentence was reduced and you had the good fortune to walk out of that state prison on that day, how long did you serve for that $100 forged check? 12 years, 10 months, and 3 days. So this deals with the excessive punishment, the excessive sentencing, and just the madness, the insanity, that we would expend what was at least, at least $600,000 of taxpayer resources to incarcerate a person who wrote a check for $120. So Kelly, you're going to be fighting back. Most definitely. <laughs> yes. So we're going to come back to Kelly. And one of the things that Kelly is going to be working on in Merced County and in the Central Valley and throughout the state is emphasizing treatment and rehabilitation instead of incarceration so that every person has the opportunity to correct the behavior that we need to be held accountable for, uh, but, but to do it in a way that sets a person on a right path and, and does it in a way that's more mindful. I'm coming over to our friend David Moss. Good morning, Abby. Good morning, David. Um, so how many people were here last night when David uh, gave his rising and stirring performance? Thank you. So that was a real, a real treat, and I want to thank David for just putting himself out there. Uh, as David was doing that, let's remember he was exercising his constitutional rights to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. There was a lot in that that was controversial, and we have had many cases in the ACLU's history where people doing that kind of creative work like David did were censored. Um, and barred from doing a performance exactly with the themes that you were raising. So I just want to go back to just that freedom of speech that we protect every day. Uh, but David, you're going to be doing this tour called Instruments of Change. Correct. And it takes a few of the scenes from the play you did last night, and it matches it up with some of the legal and policy issues related to how we can change our state. Yes. So you had a presentation, the first one, as I understand it, just on Friday? On Friday. Uh, tell us about it, how it went, and where it was, and give us that story. Well, it was at UC Berkeley. Uh, I did two uh, on the campus of UC Berkeley. 
I had on my adult clothes and I was on the campus of UC Berkeley and it was amazing to, to like I said last night, be uh, in front of people doing what I love to do, what I'm very passionate about, but also speaking about something that I'm passionate about and not portraying any role, but uh, advocating advocating change, advocating uh, uh, for myself, but for other people too, to become instruments in change. Uh, the presentation basically was uh, concerning our, our drug sentencing laws, how uh, we put people in jail for no other reason than they have a drug problem, uh, which the medical community defines as a disease. And having a disease is not a crime. So. Uh, that and it was it was it was fun. I am very nervous right now. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so I David didn't know. I, most of you don't know. I might drop by your table too. <laughs> Not planned or scripted. Yeah, I'm having a lot of trouble with the English language right now. So, <laughs> so, um, so David is on tour with Instruments of Change. So if you want him to come to an ACLU chapter or your campus or your community. Uh, over the next several months, this is part of the public education to get people to think differently about criminal justice, to think differently about our drug laws, um, and to get people inspired to be part of the solution. Can I, can I say one? Yeah. Okay, I'm feeling a little more relaxed now. <laughs> Basically, what I do is I tell you about my experiences with the criminal justice system. I went to jail 14 times for being under the influence of a narcotic. Not one time when I went through a... Uh, through a courtroom, did anybody stop and say, hey, this guy has committed a violent crime, he's committed no felonies, why do we keep sending him to jail? The only treatment I got was being treated like a criminal. So, what I'm there doing on, on campuses and other organizations is, is asking people, prodding people, provoking people to not make what I'm doing entertainment but use it to go and find out who your DAs are, your board of supervisors, and demand that they stop wasting money on sending people to jail. And I, and I, I explain to you what you can do, and I explain to you what the alternatives are to incarceration for people like me. So, thank you. stay on this um, incarceration theme for a second. And we talked earlier about the fact that California's um, uh, prisons and jails are part of the, this big system of inequality. And I'm looking for Hector Biagra. Where's Hector? Hector. Hector. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, the United States is the world's leader in many things. We are proud of many things like our Constitution, but we're 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And Los Angeles County um, is a big part of that problem, just like our state of California. And um, Hector, tell the folks here about, you know, you have David over there who's going to do this Instruments of Change as public education. Meanwhile, we're suing Los Angeles County over the conditions of incarceration. What happened with Sheriff Baca just last, was it just last week? Just last week, yes. Just last week. So we've been uh, involved in a litigation against the LA County, uh, over, against LA County over its jail system for some 30 plus years now. Uh, and we feel like we've finally turned a corner. In September, we released a report about abuse, deputy on inmate abuse in the jail. And we think in many respects it's due to the overcrowding in the jail uh, and the okay, yeah, yeah. insistence uh, on over-incarceration uh, and uh, the use of a facility that doesn't meet modern standards. So we had a, a nationally recognized expert, Jim Austin, come in and prepare a report. And his report uh, assessed what percentage of the jail's population could be safely released uh, from jail uh, and put in other uh, alternatives to incarceration, like electronic monitoring, 
uh, or home arrest. And he's estimated that about 15% of the population uh, could be released from the jail. And until, until recently, the sheriff had insisted uh, that he would not um, let anyone out of the jail um, and that instead he wanted to build a new billion and a half uh, dollar jail. Bill, billion with a B. A B. Billion and a half with a B. And it, it really seemed like an incredible catch-22 uh, because he was unwilling to release anyone and the county does not have a penny, let alone a billion and a half dollars to build a new jail. Armed with this report uh, and armed with the scrutiny that our report brought on him uh, in September, uh, the sheriff is, is singing a new tune and he has committed to closing part of the jail complex, uh, part of Men's Central Jail, uh, which is by far the oldest um, and the uh, most violent part of the jail. Uh, and we think by the time we're done with him that he'll realize that he needs to close that entire jail complex. Yeah. Assembly Bill 109 that's shifting people who would have been sent to state prison to counties. And it's encouraging, on paper, for the counties to seek alternatives to incarceration. This whole system is in flux. And so in every county, there are decision points. And we want to get right in there. Um, they have these things called the Community Corrections Partnerships that are in charge of making these decisions. The community they're talking about right now is the community of the sheriff, the district attorney, the police chief, etc. Seven people sit around the table making these decisions. What we're going to do is put the community in the community corrections partnership to seek alternatives to incarceration. That's one of the big campaigns. We have. So, you know, this is a, a one big area of our work is around the criminal justice system. We're going to come back to the death penalty in a little bit. Um, but we also are doing a great deal of work to defend the rights of immigrants. Now, immigrants are affected by everything we just talked about in the criminal justice system. Um, in fact, the way in which the prisons are set up, it's poor people and everything crosses over. And our jails and our prisons are getting used increasingly as part of the immigration enforcement system. Um, so if you're involved in your community to defend immigrants' rights, raise your hand. It's a lot of people. And the people who are doing this work, some of us are citizens like I am. Some of us are also immigrants like I am. Some of us are children of immigrants like I am, uh, but some of us are the descendants of other immigrants. And then probably a handful of us are also indigenous to this continent and working to defend the rights of immigrants. Look, we're all migrants or immigrants of one form or another. Some of our ancestors were brought here in chains. Others came by choice. Uh, but this country's principles have been there for every person including the person who has just come into the country on day one. So let's start at the border for a second. Uh, Cynthia, where's Cynthia? Okay. So I understand that um, there is a lot of issues on the border of California and San Diego. Look, this is totally unscripted, you guys. <laughs> Welcome back, Cynthia. So just uh, give folks here a picture of what happens on that border. And I'll just say, um, we, I went on a trip with a group of youth from Northern California, and we walked across the border. It's easier to walk out of the Oakland Zoo than it is 
Oh, wait, wait, no. It's easier to walk into Mexico from the U.S. than it is to walk out of the Oakland Zoo. <laughs> but when you want to get into the U.S. from Mexico, boy, that is not easy. Uh, so give us a picture of what life's looking like on the border and what issues we're facing. Uh, first, I want to say I may have a little bit of trouble with English language like David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think... Uh, very briefly, a little bit of the political stuff, too, because right now we have almost 20,000 border patrol agents manning our, our uh, uh, border regions. And millions of dollars later, we still aren't satisfied that the border is secure. And so that said, uh, the border is not just, um, what you call this, a concern of border communities or border advocates, because as an advocate uh, with the ACLU, I truly believe that what happens at the border does not stay at the border. And this means that the um, cross-sections of issues there as, as border crossings, uh, the, the trafficking of, of drugs, and the uh, smuggling of human beings. So these, these complex issues kind of uh, come together to uh, form a, a nexus of what we call our border insecurity problems. And uh, a lot of the, my fellow colleagues from, from the San Diego uh, affiliate and the San Diego community will be able to share with you some of these in the session that I want to plot on our border panel <laughs> called uh, Don't Fence Us In, Why the ACLU of California Should Care About the Border. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sometimes in your life you have these moments that are aha moments. Last summer I had an aha moment because within the same month I had the chance to tour San Quentin prison and tour the border. The thing they have in common, both of them, is just an incredible amount of fences. Some of the fences are used to keep people locked out. Some of the fences are used to keep people locked in. But wherever we see that much fencing, we're pretty sure that there's a lot of civil liberties issues going on. <laughs> because fences keep people from that basic freedom of movement. And so just keep your eye out for fences. <laughs> there's probably something going on. So there's also a whole range of our work which deals with people being able to live their lives freely, not only in terms of incarceration or immigration issues, but also in terms of each of our rights to make our own reproductive decisions related to our health. I'm wondering if uh, Philida is here? No. So I'm going to come over to Kelly. And, um, you know, around the country right now, there are all kinds of laws prohibiting and restricting the basic access to contraception. Uh, the basic access of a woman to be able to make her own decision without the government telling her whether she can have an abortion or not. And uh, this year, in California, we are taking on a big step of a big goal. So Kelly, could you tell people about this goal? Sure, Abby. Um, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Abby's absolutely right. You know, the rights of women are under assault everywhere in the country on a whole bunch of different fronts, but particularly when we talk about reproductive justice, but California has a proud history of being leaders and you know not allowing the war against women to, to invade our state. And right now in California, as opposed to every place else in the country where the right to safe and legal abortions are under attack, in California we are actually trying to expand the rights of women to receive safe and affordable abortions in their local communities. Right now, for women in rural parts of our state, in you know, the north parts and some of the Central Valley parts, women may have to travel for hours and hours and hours to receive reproductive health care, including abortions. So we have a bill in Sacramento this term that would expand the ability of certain uh, primary health care providers to provide safe, after, safe and early abortions to women. And what this would mean is that women would have access to abortions in their own communities by caregivers that they already have relationships with. Um, this is putting California way above, way, way far ahead of every place else in the country. So we hope that we'll be able to pass it and set an example on reproductive justice for the rest of the country. Thank you. 
Before, when we talked about the, the rural parts of the state, this is an issue that's especially important because there are, you could go hundreds of miles in California without having access to an abortion provider. People have to travel far too to make that choice of their own. So I'm going to cross over to the other side of the room. And one of the things that I've been really um, inspired by lately is I read a book by one of the longest uh, serving ACLU supporters, a man named Jim Hormel. Uh, it's a great book. It's called Fit to Serve. And uh, Jim Hormel, for any of you who are, well, many of you will know, he was nominated by President Clinton to be our ambassador to Luxembourg. And it was uh, one of the first times uh, that an openly gay person or lesbian, bisexual, transgender was uh, called to represent the United States as our ambassador to another country. Uh, there are many people who stepped up with lies against his uh, campaign to become an ambassador, but he persevered and he became an ambassador. And it was just amazing for me to see what he had to go through to become openly gay back when he did in the 1950s and 60s, and just the struggle he went through and then how he uh, continued to serve. And that struggle is not over. Uh, so I'm coming over here to Joey. And Joey's working right now to make sure that California schools are safe for all students, including lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth. So uh, Joey, tell us a little bit about what that work looks like right now and why, why or do you feel frustrated that we still have to take on this battle after so long, or do you feel hopeful that we're making great progress? Well, our work really ranges from a lot of different things that we focus on in the student rights project. So our work ranges from know your rights presentations for students at GSA conferences to in services for teachers. We work on legislation on the local, the state, and federal level. And we also do uh, legal intakes in all of the non-compliance <coughs> school districts with dealing with issues of harassment with students, specifically LGBTQ students. And you know, it's it's hard not to be frustrated when working with, with principals who say that their students don't have constitutional rights to due process, or when they don't have freedom of speech or freedom of expression, when just uttering the word gay is then making the school climate unsafe. So yes, it is frustrating, but and the work that we're able to do with school districts coming to us for advice and for help, that makes it so So Joey and uh, many people throughout the state are working both at the school level and at the legislative level, at every level, to make sure our schools are safe for children. Uh, just in the last few years, there have been far too many teens who have committed suicide. And we need to make sure the schools are safe. And I'm a heterosexual person. I'm married to a woman. You know, no one's ever asked me, Abdi, when did you know you were straight? <laughs> <laughs> Someone should ask me that today. But each of us needs to speak up to make sure that our schools, our communities are safe, and that every person, gay or heterosexual, has the same rights to a safe school to marriage, to the benefits that our society provides us. So this is a lot of work now. You all, it, we don't expect every one of us to be an expert on every issue. But we do ask that each of us be involved to protect people's rights every day. And that's the responsibility uh, that we have. Uh, Kevin, this is Kevin Keenan. Uh, Kevin was with me yesterday when I had to buy some clothes because I had left my clothes behind. <laughs> Um, so special, special honor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it was these jeans, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't uh, break out of your comfort zone and go for something slightly darker. No, I couldn't. <laughs> and, and yes, I am wearing the same t-shirt I wore yesterday. <laughs> I wasn't going to point that out. <laughs> but no, I did not sleep in it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Kevin, I'm about to do a quick bridge over, but um, we're very excited to be here. You've been uh, working in the ACLU for, since you were a high school student, and then while you were a college student and a law student. So, just real quick, uh, coming out of this conference, what do you hope that all of us could leave here with? Um, 
How many folks here are under the age of 25? Raise your hand. Woo! That's the most important thing going on here, I think. What you're experiencing, which for so many of us is brand new and historic and never, and we've never come together like this, is your new normal. And I, and I want to um, wish for all of you the realization that um, you're going to be a leader. You're already a leader, but um, Abby's job is yours for the taking. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly Hector's job, <laughs> but but really, um, this you're going to remember this experience the rest of your life. It's going to add to um, a collection of experiences that make you uh, an effective fighter for the human rights of all people. Um, get every moment you can out of it. Uh, ran into poor Abby who hasn't slept in weeks sitting in uh, the hotel lobby last night after some of us were rolling back from Denny's and headed straight to bed, and he's sitting with a group of dreamers, uh, raise your hand, who were there in the lobby last night. Plotting <laughs> what's next. And, and take every moment you can to, um, to get everything you can out of this and add it to the collective power of all of us together, but your own individual power as a leader and a future leader with the ACLU for human rights um, uh, and, and the state, this country, will become a better place because of you. Thanks. I also want to introduce James Gillum, who is the Deputy Director at the ACLU of Southern California and directs a lot of the work um, in Southern California, but has been really a champion of the work um, on LGBT equality for children in our schools. Uh, James, you're originally from Tennessee, right? So. Uh, Shane, I'm going to need five extra minutes, if that's okay, but I won't go on too long. So, James, we're a national organization. Uh, what's our responsibility to the rest of the country here in California? Well, of course, uh, we, have, we have great laws here in California that protect LGBT students, that provide great civil rights and civil liberties for many different populations. But you can imagine what it was like for me growing up as a gay teen, uh, in the middle of a cornfield in Tennessee, um, the bus rides, the, the daily walks down the hall, the taunts in the cafeteria. Uh, there are no protective laws for students in Tennessee. Just a few days ago I was in Arizona. There are no protective laws for the LGBT community in Arizona. So the great work that we do at the ACLU not only sets the precedent because we know that the laws we pass here in California move across the country, but it's also important for you to keep in mind that the fundraising we do here uh, also helps fund work in states like Mississippi, Tennessee, Arizona, where there are far fewer ACLU members, far fewer donors, and frankly, far fewer private foundations where those individual ACLUs can seek funding. So the work that we do here both provides legal opportunity, but also financial opportunity for the rest of the country. So every dollar you give, you can take pride in the fact that when Constance got to take her date to the prom, you helped fund that litigation as well. So this whole conference is on the idea that we have power individually, but we have more power when we're working together. So we had the pleasure, at the same dinner that I met Kelly, I also met LaToya. So LaToya, please stand up. I'm standing up. <laughs> So Latoya is a, is, a, is a mother and her daughter has joined her at this conference. Uh, she just signed up to the ACLU list about three months ago on the email list, saw about the conference, decided this is the time to stand up. And at the dinner last night, Latoya said that one of the things that bothers her so much is that in, in our state, that if you've been uh, in prison with a felony, that you cannot vote. Um, so, Latoya, tell us what year were you in prison and when did you get out? I didn't go to prison. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I got it wrong. Jail. Jail. Okay, tell um, us your story. Sorry. At 18, I was convicted of a felony. And um, I, one of the biggest penalties for me was losing the right to vote. 
So I went, um, I was convicted in 1999. I was on probation in 2004. And from 2004 until last night, um, I just thought I could no longer vote. So I haven't voted in any election um, since I became convicted. And I was convicted at 18. So um, I'm going to register to vote today. So Latoya isn't going to register to vote today. Latoya is going to register to vote right now. Okay. And Kelly is the one who is going to give her the voter registration form. Welcome to the club. Thank you. 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 Thank you you can vote. If you're on parole or in a state prison, you cannot vote. But once you get your rights back from parole, you can vote. So welcome. Thank you. Okay, so as you can see, we have a lot going on and we have a very powerful force. Um, I want to highlight two main things to, to wrap this up real quick. One is, among all the things we're doing this year, we have one goal, which is an epic goal, which is the Safe California campaign to replace the death penalty with life without parole. Where's Chris from San Diego? Okay. You collected over 400 signatures to qualify that initiative for the ballot. Stand up. And just the last thing that I want to leave you with is that we have um, this coming spring a historic moment when the United States Supreme Court will vote on whether to allow the Arizona anti-immigration law to stand. They will hear the arguments on April 25th. Today is Sunday. Next Sunday morning, we're going to set off and kick off a nationwide campaign to make clear that we are all united in every state in opposition to this law. Uh, the road trip will kick off from San Francisco next Sunday morning. So if you're in the Bay Area, you'll get the details. We'll invite you to join us. Uh, Sunday afternoon, we'll be in Fresno. We'll be at the in front of the Save Mart Center. Uh, we've just worked this whole thing out. So if you haven't heard before, don't be mad at me. We just <laughs> figured it out. Um, and then from there, the next day, Monday, we're going to be in Los Angeles at a rally at East LA Community College. There will be a lunch briefing in Orange County. And then we'll end that day at Chicano Park in San Diego. Right. And then from there, we're going to go to Arizona. The night before the Supreme Court argument, there will be a town hall meeting. And then there will be protests on the day of the argument. And then we keep going through the great states of New Mexico and Texas, holding rallies and other events. And then we're going to go to uh, Alabama, which had one of these laws. This whole campaign was inspired by the video you're about to see. It's a young man named Brandon, who lives in a small town in Alabama called Clanton. Alabama has a law very similar to Arizona's. And with this video, Brandon is helping us kick off uh, this nationwide campaign called Estamos Unidos. Thank you. 
van a ser parados por este, ninguna razón y van a ser deportados. Todas las personas de, de Clanton, ellos este, aman a sus niños, se preocupan por ellos y ellos no quieren ser separados por sus niños. HB 56 is a hurtful thing. If other people get involved, it will spread widely, and then uh, other people that, that aren't concerned will be aware, and their thoughts could affect how we see Alabama today. It could become a better place. <laughs> the first to see this video. Uh, the website will be live on Monday. There will be a petition to President Obama. Um, everyone who signs the petition will receive a free poster mm -hmm. and it will kick off what we hope will be a really big campaign and we invite everyone to um, participate in it. Excellent. I want to just say a big word of thanks to the staff who have organized this uh, conference. Uh, please raise your hand if you're part of the planning committee of the staff who organized this great event. Uh, let's give them a big round of applause. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! And then we're uh, Karen, uh, who, who's doing? Oh, Hamira. Hamira, come on up and uh, give people a sense of what's next. Thank you. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo!